to a very, very disappointing Impact Wrestling. Now, I want to make this clear. When you hear and see the title, you're going to go, oh, damn. He hated the show completely. All the stuff there was terrible. No. 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 Some very good promo segments. Decent matches. A little intrigue when it comes around Caleb. It, it was not a bad 100% show. It wasn't. The wrestling was good. Audio wasn't bad. Situations were set up pretty well. That was not the issue. Look at my face. I'm flashing right now. I'm flashing it. I don't know how many shots it is. I'm going to keep talking until those shots are done. And then whenever their shots are finished, then you'll see my beautiful mug again. Yeah, you, you see my face. Guys, before I get started, this show was so bad in production. I think this is what happened. And I know I should be doing this at the end of the show. I'm not. Because... It pissed my ass off beyond no end to the point where I'm going like, you know what? I want to give this a wash. I literally didn't want to review it. I was think I was going to review it, but then at once, right around now as I'm setting up, I'm going like, why am I going to review this show? Because you can barely see the shit. But I'm going like, no, I got to review it and let people understand my point of view. Why? I always say over and over and over and over again that these damn companies, except for two... They get it. You have a large chunk of your people watching on stream, either because of the pandemic or because streaming has become highly popular. They understand that they have to present the show in a way that can be seen and you get the most money out of it so you can get interest, you get your merch, and you get people wanting your company more than others to succeed. You can say a lot about WWE, and I've said a lot, but they get it. You can say about AEW, but they get it. When you see this, this is what I thought. Simply, someone in production, possibly someone new, said, Damn, this venue's lighting sucks ass. Bring everything like this to compensate for the lighting being bad. Make it all close up. Like a Vincent Kenny McMahon would say back in the early 80s when he went to venues he knew that weren't very good. He always made the camera work a lot closer and tighter to compensate to a certain extent because a lot of the venues back in the 80s and 90s were not that great for pro wrestling. Lights were not always set for pro wrestling. And where Impact is right now, it's obvious the lighting isn't good. But when you see, it will piss your ass off as a spectator at home. Over at the venue, you're fine. You're good. They're catering to you. But when somebody at home who's paying $4.99 on the Impact YouTube channel and the Ultimate Insider and Access TV, which is the where the Fight TV act or Access TV app, you're pissed. Particularly at a couple of times the stream kind of jumped around a little bit. So you get my point why that I'm only going to briefly talk about what happened in the ring, and I'm just doing the story because the matches were all generally fine, but this is about the story because production is a wash. Whatever happened in the ring, you couldn't even barely see it. Now, first match Macklin versus Eddie Edwards. Now, it's good to see Eddie. I would have liked him to change his ring attire though because he still looks like plain old Eddie. I personally, as I said before, I thought it was two people. Now, well, I thought it was two people who would have turned on Team Impact. Was Macklin or a Christopher Saban. Chris Saban. I would have liked Chris Saban to turn because I think if he turned, he would change his ring attire. He would change his attitude. He would change all of it. When you see a Eddie Edwards, he hasn't really changed anything. He changed his ring work, yes, to a certain extent to be more hardcore than normal, to be more ruthless than normal, but his ring attire could have helped him immensely. That could have helped immensely to really differentiate differentiate himself as a on and no more member now. Because just having red doesn't mean anything. Now, on and no more came out when he won the match by well, he didn't win the match. He basically nailed Macklin in the back with Kenny 
and it was DQ'd and Macklin won. But this was not about Macklin winning. This is about nailing him, letting him have it, even though pretty much Tom made it very clear that if he can't win, he's going to do something. Eddie doesn't care. That is the attitude he's giving. I just wish his ring attire would reflect that. Then Honor No More comes out and they said, you can't stand this situation. You can't stand it because now you're thinking about it. You're thinking that we're right, trying to mess with them. And you see Heath being bothered because he is going to be having his match with Moose's sacrifice. Vincent shows up. Vincent say he's delusional, thinking he's ever going to get a real win. And then you got Heath pretty much saying, come in here and let me kick your ass. So they have a match. And simply put, and I want to make this clear to everyone who watches this, listen, do we say Heath is a main eventer? No. Say it again. Heath is not a main eventer. I know this. So don't say, oh, why are we still dealing with this Ham and Eger WWE guy? I know no one's saying it now, but that's what a lot of people would think. It is not about it anymore. We got talent that we have on the show because it's obvious that they don't got that much talent on the show. We have no choice but to try and, if they have the ability, push them to see what will happen. Look at EC3. I say this again because we know EC3 was an incredibly great talent. He still is. But after being typecast by WWE as one of their rejects, he was still considered in the business a general mid-carder. Yes, he's been to other promotions and they did do something with him before he went to WWE. But after going to WWE, he was considered a ham and egger. He had to be pushed to see if he really had something. Now, I'm not saying Heath is the greatest. No. But we need to push people to see what happens. Like I said with, and I know I get a lot of controversy with this, I didn't think Ginger was a good good wrestler. He's average, Ginger Mahal, or Jinder Mahal. But the point is, seeing him in the main event of SmackDown back in 2016 was the wisest thing to do to show that if the WWE is willing to take a chance on a mid Carter that has never done anything, that could pan out eventually. Of course, there's going to be failures. But in this situation with Impact Wrestling, where they've gone through all of the roster, all of the ones that are singers competitors, they've gone through them all, you're going to have to use people in tag teams now and push them. I'll say it again. They need to be pushed because you got nobody. Nobody at Impact. If you really want a homegrown guy to get somewhere, you're going to have to push the mid carters to see if they'll pan out. There you go. If you don't want to hear it, and there's nothing else I can tell you, you can find someone else that'll agree with you on YouTube if you're brand new to the channel. How you doing? Now, second match. Hmm. Well, actually, it's the third match because it kind of blended the first and second match. Third match, Slamovich versus Rose. I can't remember her first name. I didn't need to remember her first name because what? She didn't even last one minute, maybe 20 or 30 seconds, given a little bit of time, and <laughs> Marsha Slamovich whoops her ass. Miss Mohawk herself destroyed her. She's now, what, five or six, and I think six and oh now? I think she's six and oh. She has been pushed so heavily, destroying outside talent, which is great. She's the only one they're doing this with, which shows how thin the Impact roster is. That only one wrestler, one wrestler, is given outside talent to destroy instead of pushing others, making them feel important. I'm just saying. Now, we got Madison Rain versus Cassie. We got the influence versus inspiration. And I got to say this. If any, I'll say this again. I've said this before. If you've ever seen my Booking the Wrestler Impact Edition, I pushed Caleb with a K. I think maybe I might connect it below. I don't think you'll care that much about it. 
But just to see I, if I can find it, because I didn't put it into a playlist, I'll go and find that episode. I will stick it in the description with nothing else. I'll just say, enjoy the episode that I'm doing. And here's the link. This, this just makes you want to think, what are they doing? Caleb could do something entirely different. They're literally using Caleb with a K as a catalyst between the influence and inspiration that he's being pulled back and forth between the four women. Now, mind you, you got, look, Jesse and Cass are gorgeous women if they weren't married. Madison is married. And Tennille, I don't believe she's married. She has a boyfriend. But if they weren't all married, any one of them, any guy would want. They're all beautiful women. They're both, well, all of them are pretty well built. They got to be to go in the ring. So you're like, I want to be in Caleb's position. But then you're thinking, I don't want to be in Caleb's position because, yes, the influence is being pushed. Yes, the inspiration of being pushed. Is the storylines good? The way they've been booked as is at this point? No. But they are being spotlighted, which I'm glad about. But I will not lie again. I said when the inspiration came in, they shouldn't have ever won the titles because they had no total direction for them. They didn't until Tennille came back. And now they have a storyline with a fellow Aussie. That is why I didn't want them to have those damn titles because I knew they weren't going to be pushed. Now they are being pushed because they got a storyline. And I'm not saying no one doesn't love the inspiration. I'm just saying they deserve better booking. Even though I have said that they should have never done the, the iconic stuff so quickly. I got pretty pissed at that. But at this point... They could have easily done it by now and no one would complain. It's been more than a few months easily since Bound for Glory. Let's move on because there's no point in saying anything. Well, I got to say it because who wouldn't want to do this? Look in my face. You see Caleb catching a Jesse because she tried to take out Tennille. Uh, who wouldn't want to be in that position with a gorgeous woman who wasn't married? Let's move on. Now, Tasha Steeles and Chelsea Green, number one contenders match. Now, this was set up last week. It is a number one consent. Well, they didn't tout it as a number one contenders match. They didn't state it was. They said, here, Chelsea Green and Tasha Steeles are in a match. If Tasha loses or Chelsea loses, they do not get in the match with a Mickey James, who I believe you got a shot of her in my face. Those boobies are out and in charge. They look good. One of the few shots I could get that didn't look totally zoomed in. Unfortunately, it would have been nice if zoomed in completely in the boobs, but it didn't go that far. Let's move on there. Was this useful? Yes. Tasha won, even though she had to cheat. And due to the fact that Chelsea begged a Mickey James. She didn't ask her. She kind of begged. Look, I need to earn this. Don't interfere even if a Sienna Evans gets involved. Which she did. And Mickey didn't want to just leave it. But she had no choice because she wanted to keep her word. There you go. There you go. Now. Was it effective? Honestly, it was necessary for Tasha to get a second shot. Hmm. But did it need to happen? For me personally, no. Last. <sighs> Look. No surrender. Tasha should have won. She should have. So this feels like if she does win, it was ridiculously dumb for her to have that match in the first place at no surrender. I'm just saying. Let's move on. Jonah versus Swinger, where there was no Ziggy Dice coming out with him. There was no setup for Ziggy Dice. If anybody loves Ziggy Dice and they want him to work with a Jonah Swinger, you didn't get it. They're probably going to set this up where Johnny and Ziggy are just going to meet each other because they're getting their asses whooped. But what did we get? We get a Johnny Swinger sighting where Mr. Yeah, got his ass destroyed. 
and it was more about PTO, the perfect, no, what is it? PCO, I forgot what the name, the name of it. Damn, what was it? They called him the um, perfect creation number one, perfect creation number one. I believe that's what, it's, what his name means. Let me ask you a question. I know he doesn't 100% look like him, but doesn't he remind you Crazy Steve in the face? I'm not saying they're related, but for some reason, when I look at him and Crazy Steve, they kind of remind me of being relatives. Kind of. Not saying they are actually relatives, but if they were together, I would say they kind of remind me like they were family. Really. But I'm not surprised that this was about PT, PCO, dealing with Jonah. PCO, the, the moment I saw PCO get splatted, the first thing that went from my mind as Jonah's leaving, just sit up. You know you want to do it. And he sits up just like Undertaker. Exactly. If he's the perfect machine, the perfect Frankenstein, he had to sit up. That's what he was. That's what happened. A little bit of fighting and Jonah retreats, but makes it very clear. This is about that. Will it be a great match? I don't know. It looks like it really needs to be about putting over Jonah with a much more experienced veteran in a PCO. That's what I'm hoping for. Let's move on. Um, what else do we have here? Diana Perrazzo had her talk saying clearly the champ champ challenge still goes on. No one else can even deal with me. Um, Gazelle or, or Jan Janelle, I believe because what, what is her name again? Gazelle Shaw. I think her name is Gazelle or Janelle Shaw. Interferes with the, with the interview, which kind of pisses her off. And it's obvious she wants a title match. I'm sure she's going to go after one of those titles. But here's the thing that's pissing me off. After it was over and she speaks her piece, you see my Killer Frost come out. And she's saying, because of our match before, I went to Impact Management. I want a rematch. Bitch, please stop. And I don't normally say, bitch, please stop to anyone. And I'm not talking about my Lady Frost. I'm not talking about Shaw. I'm talking about Impact Management. What was the point of her being on the debut of Shaw, where she herself has never appeared on Impact TV until then? She needed a freaking win. And that's Lady Frost. Shaw needed a, fr uh, needed a win. You couldn't give each one of these women a jobber. It could be the same job. It could have been Rose or someone else. And each one of them could have beat her or someone else. No. You had two women who needed to need a debut win. And you made one of them, one of them win while the other one jobs. Now, if, if Lady Frost gets her win Back at Sacrifice, this is 50-50 booking, and they should never did that damn situation in the first place. It shows they were dumb. Final thing. A eight-man tag. Violence by Design and... <laughs> the Tonga Brothers. God. Gorilla. <laughs> damn it. Damn, I, I don't know what it is, guys. I, I don't know. This stupid old man that you look in front of you that that literally cannot stand laughing when he hears the gorillas of destiny. God, have to. <laughs> I don't know why they make me laugh. But before the match, did the Tonga brothers, Tonga Lewis, Nuez, well, Lua, thank you. I'm thinking Tonga Lua. And... Toma Tonga. I'm still going to keep calling them Tonga Brothers because it's a lot more easy to remember. But there was a nice, nice talk. Just like a um, Jake something. His vid pack was very good. And the Tonga Brothers, they had a good, good, good talk before Violence by Design came out and said we should work together as a business arrangement. We got screwed because of the Good Brothers. Let this be a business arrangement. We won't screw you. You want Jay White. We want the Good Brothers. We want a pound of flesh. Both of us, let's get it. Now, what happened before the match happened? There was a flat-out brawl. 
and eventually you got Scott and security trying to separate all eight of these men, which didn't work. Scott comes out, he said, this is not going to work like this. I'm done with this. This got to be no DQ. But then on top of it, on top of it, Vonda's by design, they supposedly get a title shot at no, at, at, at sacrifice. And now, along with that, because I got to remember it, if Eric Young came out during that match, they lose their shot. So it's like, wait, so the only reason you get this now, two days before sacrifice, is because of a freaking brawl that should have happened the week before. Why couldn't they done the week before the brawl and then have this no DQ match now instead of just leaving it at the last minute, within the last 10 to 15 minutes of the damn show? You couldn't have booked this last week, the brawl. Didn't have to actually have the match that Scott came out. He said, Vonda's by design. You said you got it great because you got screwed. Okay, at sacrifice, you get your title shot. But due to the fact you guys want to tear each other apart, you're getting a no DQ match next week. And you, Eric, if you come out and interfere at all because you're making this a big mess, they lose that title shot. They could have done promo segments for this, but no, they did not. So I don't agree for the setup. Was the match fun? Yeah, I don't have a problem with it, even though I don't like eight and six men tags all the time, unless it's for a title, like the trios thing, the trios title, which we still haven't seen yet, and it's been three years. I hope by the end of this year they will bring it out. They better bring out a trios title by the end of this year because they need it, because they keep having six men tags and it really feels empty. But still, this was a very disappointing video production show. Was the matches bad? No. Were the vid packs bad? No. Were the interviews bad? They could have been more better ones. But it was okay. The setup for sacrifice, fine. But video production was so bad, was so stupid, whoever they hired, don't care if they used to be former WWE. The moment they saw there was too much lights, they said, Oh, shit. We need to zoom in like this and get everyone like this. Because we can't let them see the lights. Like a Vince would do. Sorry for being too loud, but you get my point. And I hope you enjoy this impact review. Please give me a comment below. I will see if I can find the very video I'm talking about when it comes to Cannibal Decay. Being the... Ooh... The Mr. Madness known as Suicide. Peace.